Welcome, everyone. We are letting people into the session. They are entering the room right now. And we give some time so that everyone can get in. The live stream is also active uh, for this session here. OK, welcome, everyone, to our little session. Uh, it's called, I have to look at my cheat sheet here myself because it's such a long title. A look under the hood, how GDS service innovation system works from an org design perspective. Uh, my name is Jan Schmiedgen. I'm the session host of today's session. I'm also one of the co-organizers of this Design Thinking Barcamp 2020. Um, and I'm also a partner at Codify and a part of the research team at the Hasso Plattner Institute, where we look into design thinking, adaptation, and scaling design thinking, these kinds of things. And this is why. It's a pleasure for me to have this session here with you today. Um, and also the guest, which I will introduce uh, in a second, um, a special guest uh, with me, because um, this topic is very dear to me. And before we start, um, before I introduce you to our guest, I would like to show you um, why I'm actually running this session and where it originated from. And for that, I share my screen here. And it might be a good idea to go full screen on your side for that, so you can see it better. OK, let's have a look at it. A look under the hood of GDS system. So first of all, I should say one thing. Uh, over the years, um, I've become a big fan um, of Edward Steaming who once said this beautiful quote, a bad system will beat a good person every time. And I would say a bad innovation system will especially beat good innovators almost every time too. So this is why one could actually put in here innovator, design thinker, lean startup, aficionado, whatever. Um, but you could also put in any innovation management approach there because Regardless what kind of agile way of working you use or what combination of be it Scrum, be it Lean Startup, be it design thinking, if the system works against the principles of this innovation approach or innovation idea, it will kill it or it, innovation will not happen. And then the, all the blame is on the methodology suddenly. And the result of this we can see everywhere. I mean, we have organizations where we have cargo cults, lots of innovation theater going on. Agile fall, fake agile, which has become its own hashtag in the agile community, and so on and so forth. And I think also um, Safi Bakal, um, the author of Loon Shots, um, said beautifully, um, now I have to think how, how the original quote was. Um, ah, yeah, structure eats culture for breakfast. And I really like that uh, quote. It heavily resonates with me because that's what I observed over the past 10 to 15 years in organizations. And this is why. I'm not shy of confronting managers with this quote. I always tell them, guys, bad managers change the people, good managers change the system. And with changing the people, I mean all these kinds of trainings and saying, oh, our people need to have the right mindset and they need to some retraining and then everything will work out. It's not that easy. It's not that easy. And you all know how it works out in the end. If you just have training or if you open up a fancy innovation lab with no bridge to the core, it's all flashes in the pan. This is another reason why over the years I collected what I call innovation vehicles and pro program building blocks of Vanguard organizations that actually made innovation work. This could be Intuit, this could be Google, this could be others. And I collected all the different entities and, and vehicles um, that one could combine to really create an innovation system that actually works. And here comes now my point. Last bar camp in 2019, we talked about that, but we talked about it for a so-called transformation B 
So if you're interested in transformation B or transformation A, it's a, the dual transformation philosophy um, popularized by, by and, and created by uh, InnoSight. Um, and check that out if that's interesting for you. We won't go into that today. But what I want to say here is the following. We, we talked about that and looked into, okay, how would actually an entrepreneurial ecosystem look like and what are the support vehicles and innovation vehicles along the way for an innovation team to proceed? But then I got lots of feedback from participants and they said, Jan, that's really nice, but please, our problem is not that we have to create an exploration engine here with intrapreneurs. So it was only, I would say it was 10% of, of the people in the room uh, that had such a thing in place. Our problem is to renew the core. Our problem is more a transformation A problem. And then I thought, okay, well, then let's save that up for the next bar camp. Um, and here we are. Um, I've chosen a transformation A initiative where an already existing system needs to be digit digitalized um, where old paper services need to get become digital. And I ju didn't just want to pick an example that is, well, I don't, I, I, let's put it like this. I like complex examples um, where we can learn quite a lot from. Um, and so I thought, okay, let's take something that is really massive in that scale. And this is why I picked gov.co.uk and the government digital service, because they, really um, have done a remarkable work. And that brings me to the guest um, of today's session. And this is Martin Jordan. Martin is the head of service design at Government Digital Service. And I know him now for quite some years. He's a first hour service design aficionado and expert. He worked at Nokia here. He was part of the team of Service Design Berlin, a community that made quite a lot of wave in the service design scene. Um, because they also organized, for example, the famous <laughs> service experience camp. They published the service cassette, a really nice um, 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 medium that you can also check out on medium.com. Um, he's also engaged in a group called the Public Service Lab Germany, where they try to push government out of their comfort zone and try to push digitalization in Germany and so on and so forth. But besides all of that, he in the end, he still fled Germany, unfortunately. <laughs> and went to England because there he could really, at GDS, um, work on things that matter to him. Uh, and that is uh, working as a designer on, on systems and systemically and on a real massive scale digitalization um, initiative. Chris will also be in the chat. He will help us moderating. And this is the agenda. Um, we try to keep it short in 30 minutes, but we have never tested it yet, what we present to you. That might this is therefore it might be that we will be will get a little bit over time. No problem for every one of you. We will all be able to see all the content that Martin presents. And if then the Q and A session starts a little bit belated, it's also no problem because we can then um, you can then just leave for the next session. We will record everything, and so it will be on YouTube. And also we um, offer you if some people want to stay a little bit longer to stay a little bit longer to discuss with us. Okay, enough, enough of talk to prepare uh, Martin's um, entry into the scene. Martin, say hi to everyone. Hi. <laughs> I hope you can hear me all right. Um, I'm, I'm right now in London. Uh, it's uh, getting sunny outside, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so thank you very much for your kind words uh, and for the lovely introduction. Um, and maybe uh, let's just get started. Then let's get started. Okay, and this is how this will work. Um, in normal workshops, we love to use posters and especially to show really systemic relationships between a system and so on and so forth. The problem is now we are suddenly online. So what we both try to do is to kind of recreate a poster um, discussion with you um, with the tools that we have at hand here. Let's see how that works. This is a big experiment for us. Uh, and how that works is I might ask Martin some questions from time to time, and he walks us through this poster that we've prepared here. It's a good idea to go full screen again, so press the button. 
So one thing I have to say, like this is the, the poster is really all of the work of, of Jans. So I have uh, I have uh, spent a bit of time with him sitting down and describing things, but he uh, he really made sense of all the all the stuff that I have told him. So all the kudos to Jan. Um, it's it's mostly it's largely his work. Really, really, really. Thank you, Martin. But I wouldn't be able if guys like you would fed me all the time with this information that is so exciting. Let's start. Okay, this is the overview. You're not supposed to read that. Um, I want to start with something else. I just want to start first with that one. Some of you might know this. This is the service. Um, oh, sorry. This is the um, service design process um, that GDS communicates to the world and that they also use, well, everywhere, basically everywhere. It has become very famous and it looks so innocent. Discovery, alpha, beta, life. Great. And of course, it all starts with user needs. How could someone disagree with that? How could someone not get it? However, we all know that the devil lies in the details. So there's quite a lot of complexity behind everything. And if you're a service designer, you might be familiar with the service blueprint, where in order to create a compelling customer experience in the front end, there needs to be done lots of things. And often the more in the back end, the simpler the front end becomes. And I would say it's the same here. If a service design team at GDS wants to run smoothly through this process, it needs lots of help and support from a back end. And the back end is what we will look at right now. So what you can see in the upper part, in the header of this um, overview here is there are phases, inception, pre-discovery, discovery, alpha, beta, and life. And what's interesting there is, um, these are not the phases from the innocent process that I showed you. There are two additional phases and Martin will tell us about them and why they are. Um, but all the other phases are actually the back end phases of this process. Let's dive into it. Let's see what is the journey of a service design team at GDS to really get a kick ass service for their citizens um, live. Mm -hmm. um. So a tiny bit more of context. So GDS, the Government Digital Service, is part of the, the Cabinet Office. So we are the very central part of the UK government. And our mission is to lead the digital transformation in the UK government. And our role is we are kind of like a, a sparing partner um, with a stick and quite a few sweet carrots to help teams in all parts of the UK government um, with a heavy focus on central government. So in Jan's example now, it's really about a, a service team somewhere in some part of the central UK government that is now interested in creating a new digital service. And so one of the, one of the key things um, that we have established is spend control authority. So about a decade ago, digital, digital and technology spent was really in the hand of individual government agencies and departments, and they were only accountable to treasury. Treasury is where in government money sits. Um, and that meant um, that potentially two uh, or more government organizations possibly uh, bought or built overlapping things. And you can imagine that that could be quite a bit of a duplication of waste, like a, a duplication and a waste of time and money. Um, or um, organizations got locked into very inflexible multi-year contracts. So what we have now in place is GDS working together with Treasury um, and then with government organizations who want to build a new service um, and they have, to, they have to have a conversation with us. So when they um, want to build a new digital service, um, as Jan described, then um, if there is a threshold, um, if they want to spend more than 100,000, and most likely uh, a new digital service is going to, uh, depending on scale, of course, but more likely is going to cost more than 100,000 um, pounds, then um, we uh, have created um, a framework for that. Um, so there is a um, spend control uh, review, um, and that is related um, to quite a few um, control and assessment criteria. So um, we have been creating um, a thing called pipeline. Um, so um, government department teams basically tell us what are all the things that they have in mind creating in the next few months, uh, what do they have on their roadmap, and maybe even um, few, a few years into, into the future. So um, and a digital service, just for a definition's sake, 
um, is something um, that is used um, online um, by people who aren't part of central government, for example, citizens. Um, and that in, can include transactional services, websites, that are, can also include mobile apps. So all of that can be considered a digital service. And um, the spend controls um, as, as a thing um, really helps service teams to, first of all, make sure that um, they are um, planning the right thing so that they're able to um, build and procure things um, with our service standard, government service standard, and our technology code of practice in mind, that they are able to plan the spending and, very importantly, be transparent about how they are spending money. Because we talk about public money, so there has to be uh, a level of, uh, of accountability and transparency uh, related to that. And also, we at the very center are able to um, help them and support them when issues arrive, arise. So we are making sure um, that things are duplicated, um, that teams have ongoing support um, throughout the development process. Um, and all of that um, is um, in a very transparent manner described um, on, on our website. Um, so Jan has a little screenshot around that that talks about um, spend controls, exactly that one. So all of that is very transparently described. So if there's a new service team trying to um, develop a uh, new and Jan is pushing me forward here. I can see that. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not, Martin. Um, we just changed the order here somehow, so that's our <laughs> prototype. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, I go out again. So, um, and then once um, a service team um, has been has been speaking um, to GDS um, and uh, has been going through that um, spend control process, um, if they have. Um, kind of like laid their cards in front of us um, and we have been working together, then um, their budget is going to be approved. Um, if they commit to um, applying to the, um, committing to the server standard and um, committing to the technology code of practice, and then um, we can uh, actually consider going into pre-discovery and then you can, you can go to the next bit, I think. Okay, great. So it so it's summarized for me, um, who needs it really easy, they are allowed to start their project now. Correct. <laughs> okay, good. Yes. Um, so one, one important thing to mention is we have now, um, you already saw the branding, we have one central, central government website. So I think in Germany and many other countries, uh, it looks quite differently. Um, there are different government entities, uh, different departments, all have their very distinct and individual website. That is not the case uh, in the UK anymore. It was the case about 10 years ago, but um, in the early days of GDS, uh, GDS was founded um, in 2010, 2011, um, we have been closing down in the first few years about 2,000 different websites. So um, now there are um, 24 ministerial departments and um, 409 other agencies and public bodies, and they all sit on this one single domain. So um, you go as a citizen or as well as a, as a public sector worker, um, you go to GovUK to find all government services and information in a, in a much clearer, faster um, and simpler fashion. So everything on GovUK and its related services looks the same, it feels the same, and most importantly, it behaves the same. Um, and that creates over time tremendous trust with users. And um, you know, um, there are um, fraudless um, emails and websites popping up everywhere. I mean, uh, you might have received um, PayPal phishing stuff. And this is the same as well for, for, for government, right? Um, but over the years, users have learned um, if something um, is not on gov.uk, it might be not the real thing. It might be not a genuine thing. Um, so all kinds of government services all sit on gov.uk um, with a similar um, appearance. This is something from renewing a passport, applying for a visa, booking a driving test, um, getting a fishing license, all kinds of small and big things. So um, the new um, service team that is going to build a service has to, has to be aware and very likely is aware that whatever they do, that service will be hosted and will be living um, on GovDDK and it will look exactly as all the other hundreds of services that are already there. Martin, one question. Are the rumors true that some ministers um, or some local lords <laughs> tried to create own websites, even though 
um, it was clear that they should publish their services under the um, guidance of gov.co.uk, of gov.uk. Um, and then uh, citizens did not trust this website and it was all wasted the money. Are these rumors true? Did these things happen? I mean, if you, if you look around a bit, Google a bit, you will, you will find websites that uh, might not live on gov.uk. Um, but it's exactly that, that problem. There is, there's a trust issue then. And um, if users don't trust these organizations, and it might, might include um, payments if it's about licensing, uh, getting a fishing, fishing license or something like that, or even, even bigger things, um, if people don't, don't, don't trust um, government, then there, there is a problem. So we have, we have seen domains that have been sitting, sitting on, um, we have been seeing, seeing services and information websites that sit on, on uh, other domains. Um, and over time, very likely the, the service owners and the people responsible will, will um, get this feedback from the users and then um, very voluntarily um, come and go to the GovUK website and um, come under this umbrella. But Never. I mean, to be fair, um, it has been, there has been pushback, right? Like, to be honest with you, um, if you suddenly take, um, take responsibility and um, control over your website away, um, this will, of course, um, create um, quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of um, um, complaints. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Okay, but let's let's leave it to this to this because one could of course talk about many things there. It was exactly. just one exactly. one interesting thing, um, yeah. and yeah. you answered the question. Thanks, thank you. Uh -huh. sure. Um. So going forward, so we are now in pre-discovery. That means we want to um, um, get off the ground quite quickly. So we want to really build a service, um, but there might be a few things um, we need to uh, do before doing that. And one of the things is well, we need a team. So who's going to who's going to build the service? So especially if it's a more um, kind of immature um, service team, they might not have um, a fully assembled digital team um, at hand already, right? So um, then um, we have created uh, a procurement or quite a few procurement frameworks um, what that we call the digital marketplace, and this is really where you go to find technology or people for digital projects in the wider public sector. So all of that. Uh, what you can find there are vetted suppliers that have government experience. So you can go there to find a single individual, maybe a developer or a user researcher, um, but you could also go there to find a team that helps you provide a certain outcome. Um, and in addition to that, you can also go there to find research participants or even user research labs that you might uh, need later once you have built something, um, or um, even, even yeah, in the same uh, later stage, uh, you might also require um, cloud hosting or maybe a physical data center space. So all of that can be found on the digital marketplace. So this is a very good starting point for teams um, that are less uh, mature. And then in addition to that, um, you already might have civil servants with a bit of with a bit of a digital curiosity maybe. Um, so we have created the GDS Academy. So that is kind of like a like a um, training facility. Um, where we offer training for public sector worker, workers. Um, and that training courses that we offer there explain how to work in an agile team and design a digital service. So that starts then uh, with training courses around um, digital and um, agile awareness. We have digital leadership courses, but also it goes, goes further into working level courses for product managers or even introduction to artificial intelligence uh, in government. So there's, there's quite a lot um, that people can, can learn there and pick up when it comes to skills. I can't click so fast, here we go. <laughs> um, so um, I touched on that quite a bit when I talked um, about the spend controls process. So we have quite a few building blocks in place that you have to agree on if you want to build a digital service and get the spending approved. Um, and that um, includes um, quite a few things. I already briefly mentioned a, a so-called service standard um, so that um, the service standard helps um, teams to create and run great public services. And it provides principles of how to build a really good service. Um, then there's another building block, which is our digital data um, and technology profession capability framework. It's quite a lengthy thing, but it's basically um, job descriptions and role descriptions, oh, not so fast, 
Um, Sorry, ro role descriptions. So, um, for example, like what to expect of a data scientist, what to expect of a user researcher, what to expect of a of an interaction designer. So we have very detailed um, skills and job descriptions all available there, and it makes it also for um, government organizations very easy to actually hire these people because there is a point of reference. It lists all these still fairly new, at least in government, fairly new job roles. So even smaller. Um, departments and agencies are able to well hire based on on that job description a new person into their team um, to get started with a service now you can you can zoom into the into the service standard yeah yeah so so the service standard as says um, as i said um, helps teams um, create and run great public services and um, it has uh, been going through quite a bit of iteration. So last year we've been refreshing um, that thing for the for the third time, and it contains basically three larger sections um, outlined in fourteen points. So the first section is all around meeting user needs. It has points like, well, you have to first of all understand who the users are, what are their needs, um, and what is really the problem you are tr trying to solve with your service for these users. So what is the scope of the service? Um, and then making sure that you provide a joined up experience across all these channels. The second section, the second section um, is about providing a good service. Um, so that um, includes um, having a multidisciplinary team, iterating regularly. Um, and a, a third section covers then all things related to technology, related to security, related to making um, code open source afterwards. Um, and um, also collecting performance data, which is very important. So all of that um, is set out in the service standard um, that service teams have to follow. It's mandatory, it's not an option. They have to follow that standard because this really ensures that these services are well-built, resilient, and really solving users' problems and addressing users' needs. And that service standard um, has more than just these 14 headlines. It has, has way uh, more detailed descriptions, but um, it comes together with what we call a ser the service manual. The service manual is basically a handbook um, that explains how to fully meet the standard. So how to build great services that are meeting the standard. And in order to do that, uh, the service manual has quite a few um, chapters, if you like. So um, it covers accessibility, it covers assisted digital, um, and how to measure success. Um, it covers how to um, set up a team, how to manage a service team. Um, it um, covers as well in quite a level of detail how agile delivery works, how to conduct user research, um, but also how to name um, a service, how to structure, how to scope a service, and also how to prototype and then uh, use existing design patterns. So there's quite a lot um, in there. I think when Jan always goes to the next the next bit, he's, he's uh, trying to push me forward. Um, that's, a little bit, yeah, yeah, but only a little bit. No, no, that's absolutely fine. So, um, so let's assume um, the team um, is assembled. Um, might we might have uh, in that case like brought in um, some people that are not um, part of the civil service, some expert that we need, um, and usually a discovery a discovery team um, that is then set up is is a fairly small team. You have someone who is maybe a product manager. You have a user researcher who's able to understand what, who the users are and what their needs are. You often have a have a business analyst, and maybe you have a have a have a designer as a sparing partner in there as well, and possibly a delivery delivery manager. So then the discovery um, is going to um, kick off, and uh, discovery, um, as it says there, um, is a thing that lasts between a month um, and maybe two months. And um, the whole point of that is trying to fundamentally understand the problem that the service team tries to solve. So before committing um, to build any kind of service, it's really about understanding, understanding the users, understanding what they are trying to achieve, understanding technology, existing technology, understanding legislation, because all of that is um, quite likely um, bound and linked to existing um, legislation that we have in place for maybe even hundreds of years. And it is about understanding the underlying policy intent. Um, what is it that government is trying to achieve in the larger, in the larger scale? And also um, 
identifying opportunities how to improve things. Because as Jan said in the beginning, quite likely a service already exists in some shape. Maybe it's a paper form, maybe it's a telephone uh, based service, um, but in some shape, there is probably um, um, uh, an earlier version of something. So it's very unlikely that we have a green field. Often it is a brown field that we're dealing with. Um, it is about um, understanding how to, um, yeah, how to um, scope the problem in the first place. And then there are quite a few things um, while um, you start um, kicking off your discovery, quite a few things um, that are rele relevant as well in desk research. So um, the UK government, I just had a look earlier again, has now 130 different blocks, not blog posts, 130 different blocks. Um, so I myself, I'm in charge of the design and government um, block and the services and government block. But there uh, are blocks related to technology, um, related to individual organizations that talk a lot about that. Um, there are um, blocks about um, data. Um, so there are a lot of communities that, that run uh, blocks. Um, just alone, the design and government block um, contains 350 different blog posts that we have been writing since uh, 2012. So there's a lot of content in there. And very likely, you will find that someone has been um, already addressing some of the things you are now discovering in your discovery phase, uh, something that has been already done in some way. So um, all the, the GovUK blocks are a great uh, place to start. And then um, one of the most important um, things, and sometimes um, these things are a bit um, not getting the attention they deserve, is our communities of, of practice. So um, one of the, the one of the great, great um, achievements of the last years is that we have been able to build communities of practitioners so you can connect to other people, um, you can share best practice with them and they can share it with you, you can discuss your challenges and really supporting each other. So one of the, one of the hearts of that is a cross-government um, Slack. Um, so just in the design channel alone, there are 2,000 people who are all in there. And if you have any kind of question that might be related to your discovery, um, a designer, user researcher, some technology specialist is able to answer that very, very likely within 15 minutes, which is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, in addition to that, um, there, there are more formats. Um, we have um, regular cross-government peer critique days where you can um, come with a certain challenge, uh, have a conversation about that. We have monthly peer support calls uh, where you can dial in if you're stuck in some way. Um, if you um, need help with some service mapping, with some user research that you're conducting. So all of that is available um, to, to, to everyone. Um, it ha happens uh, regularly. Um, and we also have um, more dedicated training. So um, the team I'm working with, um, the user Center design community team, um, we are right now offering um, 11 different types of training. And that includes, for example, more um, more nuanced training for user researchers, for example, how to create how to create good surveys, um, or we have created um, a service mapping masterclass. So even in your discovery, you might uh, pick up some of these um, maybe maybe more detailed um, capabilities and, um, and 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 skills. So um, that is something you might want to do. Um, this is a more a, a more wider thing. Um, now I think we're going into, into the alpha phase, but one of the things that, that we really deeply care about um, and we are sometimes afraid of um, is um, we, don't want, um, we don't want to um, stay in or like uh, fall behind in any way. So we're very eager to constantly network and connect um, with other industries. Um, with, with, with other independent bodies, with NGOs. We always want to learn from the best. Um, so we regularly have speakers invited um, by all our different um, working groups at GDS and in wider government. Uh, in this photograph, uh, you can see the inventor of the World Wide Web, um, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, uh, visiting us. Um, but for example, um, um, challenger banks are doing very interesting work in London. Um, and government also um, is taking a lot of payments. So we had um, the, the CEO um, of Monzo around, uh, I think it was already a few years ago, uh, but coming over for, for Lunch and Learn and just um, telling about how they are building um, their new uh, challenging uh, challenger bank. Um, and there are quite a few things to learn from that. So we are staying in touch with other entities um, that are at the very for forefront, um, having a chat with the, the Google AI folks. Um, so we are really closely connected. And um, 
why is that possible? Uh, one of the one of the things worth mentioning as well that um, many of us um, at GDS in the digital roles and other government departments have been working in the private sector before. So we have people um, who had worked um, previously for Skype or for Facebook or for Google. So we are we're really well connected. Um, and we stay connected. So um, we always um, try to stay in sync what's happening um, around us in, in the wider world. So in other words, Martin, whilst they start their project and have to get their real work doing, um, they, the teams still have the time and of course also all the offerings to, to be enabled to actually do their work because not all of them are digital professionals yet. So, so that's what my takeaway from this stage mm -hmm. is. It? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So now, so now um, we are at the end of discovery, right? So let's assume that the, the team is there at the end of discovery. So now the team should have a very thorough understanding what is the problem that they're trying to solve. In the discovery phase, they should not have built a single thing. So there should be zero lines of code written, but they should have a very fundamental understanding of What is the what is the under uh, underpinning legislation? What are the con um, technology constraints? What existing databases the service has to has to talk to? Um, um, wh who are the users? What are they trying to achieve? So all of that, the problem has to be very clearly, sharply outlined at the end of the discovery phase, and then in alpha phase, it's all about trying out different solutions, responding to the problem identified. So that means in the alpha phase, um, the teams are going to build a lot of different prototypes, testing out different ideas. So going branching out quite, quite heavily at the beginning and then narrowing it down throughout the alpha phase. And the alpha phase is going to last usually about six to eight weeks. Um, and it's really the time to explore new approaches. And by the end of the alpha phase, then um, the team should be able to decide um, which ideas are worth taking forward. And one of the one of the key things um, worth mentioning at that point, and all of the things are relevant probably throughout um, the, the the phase that's described. Um, but um, at this point, it's worth um, highlighting the government design principles. So the government design principles reflect our values, our thinking, and they heavily inform our actions and our doing. So these have been around for for a little while now. They were originally um, published in early 2012. But we just redesigned, for example, the posters communicating them, giving them a huge um, push. And I think we had um, way more than 30,000 downloads from GitHub because the posters also look quite nice. Um, but um, these um, describe our, our, our core thinking, our values. So some of them, um, just to read out a few, um, start with user needs. This is, again, related to what is also described in the service standard. Um, do less, design with data, do the hard work to make it simple. Um, and also covering covering accessibility. One of the principles is this is for everyone because the government um, can't choose like private um, companies can't choose its user base. We have to be there for everyone, and their digital skills might be very very low, um, but we have to um, account for that, and we have to make sure things work for for everyone. So um, that's 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 one that's one thing. Um, yes, so. The team now wants to build prototypes, um, and one of the one of the key starting points for that is going to the GovUK design system. So the GovUK um, design system um, contains all GovUK styles, components, and patterns, and it helps service teams to make everything they're building fully consistent with GovUK. I said or the services, they do sit on gov.dk. So we have to make sure that everything um, fits that. Um, and why is this great? Because um, if you build a new service and hundreds of other services have been built already, well, quite likely, you don't have to reinvent the wheel anywhere. So you can avoid um, repeating a lot of work that has been already done. Um, everything from little button styles to error messages, how to ask for date of birth, um, how to take um, credit card information, all of that is summarized in, in one of these um, three components, uh, one of these um, three um, sections, the styles, components, and, and the patterns. So all of that is what you can find in the design system. Um, and related to that, there's the GovUK prototype kit. So this is basically um, our slightly better version of um, um, Twitter bootstrap, if you like. Um, so this is where you where you go and can literally create a real looking 
um, servers, GovUK servers, in half a day or even less. So putting together um, um, a service prototype, this is something you do with a prototype kit in very, very little time, and also with very little coding skills. But if you even don't have the coding skills, again, you can just um, go and take um, uh, one day training. You can ask people, we have created now as well a related webinar, how to use the prototype kit. So all of that information is available. Um, so if you are now creating a little prototype in your alpha phase um, for new servers, but you realize a certain component or certain style um, isn't available, um, you can, again, go to the Slack and ask because there's a design system channel. The design system team always has one person on support um, who's there the whole day and is able to, to answer a question. And even if they wouldn't be there, there are literally hundreds of other, other designers who can also respond um, and tell you that they might have been working on a mapping component that is not yet, yet, not yet ready um, and available um, in the design system. But it is probably discussed with a lot of examples um, on, on GitHub already, um, and you can just pick it up from there. Um, Throughout your alpha phase, very likely you will create um, different prototypes. You will um, have some um, some explorations that um, come to a dead end, maybe, and then you might sometimes feel 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 stuck, and then you make progress again. So um, you can also ask throughout that phase, um, maybe not in the first week, but once you have done a bit, um, you can go and ask for a critical friend check-in workshop. So this is one of the formats that we are that we are offering. Um, because um, I talked about all the server standard and the and the and the assessments um, and all the spend controls, so we rigorously um, make you to follow the standards. And service teams quite likely want to have a check in and say and want to want to identify. Well, am I doing things right? Um, and this is where you can book a book a check in workshop or um, other lightweight checks. So, for example, um, one thing we require um, service teams to do is having an accessibility audit. So again, um, you're able to, to have um, a format for that. You can um, ask tiers to check how you're doing in that regard. Um, and at GDS, we have um, built uh, in the last few years a very, a very uh, uh, not only nice, but a very um, holistic empathy lab. So um, this is. Um, where, well, government services, as I said, really have to serve everyone. So it's it's fundamentally important to make them as accessible as possible, to make sure that services work uh, with assistive technologies like screen readers and uh, mega big magnification. So we have created an empathy lab, and you can see some of the some of the goggles there that help you um, basically recreate um, low vision, for example. We have a lot of tools and a lot of um, um, hardware that allow you to emulate the experience of people um, with um, um, certain constraints. Um, so all of that can be tested there, because you really, as a, as a team, want to make sure that your service um, is working literally for everyone. And accessibility um, is just not um, kind of sherry on the, on the cake. It is a law requirement. So all kind of public sector websites have to follow, follow that and make sure that they're fully accessible. Um, compliant with the um, WCAG um, 2.1 standard. So we're rushing here a bit through, but um, that's, 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 that's very uh, good. So the team now, at the end of their six to eight week um, alpha phase, they're building, they've been building quite a few prototypes, and they've been, narrowing, they've been able to narrow down what the best solution um, is that they can build to respond to the problem um, discovered in the discovery phase. So then they have to go um, for an alpha assessment. So this is basically where they um, come to a small um, group um, of, of assessors. Um, there's always one product person, one designer, one user researcher, and one technology person. Um, and in a four-hour session, they're basically presenting how they have been able to follow the standard. They have to cover kind of like all 14 points and show their journey of the last six to eight weeks. They show the kind of errors, the, the, the kind of problems that they identified. They um, show how they've been responding to the problem and why this solution that they have been narrowing down on, why this is the best solution um, they think um, they want to go forward with. 
um, not all service teams are going to um, necessarily pass the, the alpha assessment, um, but if they pass, um, they often create themselves um, a little mission patch that says, let's say, um, let's say the service is, um, yeah, get a phishing license, then quite likely they're creating little mission batch that says um, alpha assessment um, managed um, with a date. And this is something teams will very proudly put on their, put on their laptops. And we have, yeah, I mean, I have probably, what, 20 stickers on my laptop with all the little, the little things um, our teams have done, have achieved. So this is really kind of like a batch, a batch of honor that we have been nicking from the NASA, uh, from all their mission patches that they have on the on the astronaut astronaut um, suits, um, and there are a lot of other um, other more wider stickers. So the very um, well known one is the users first sticker, and that's really to um, tell other people about our our values, our mindsets. So very likely you have someone um, joining joining a new team or joining government, and this is probably the first sticker that, that they would like to put on their on their laptop. Um, and it's a clear statement as well in certain meetings where you might have a senior, a senior um, manager who's not fully um, buying into that. And it's a bold statement that you that you put there on your laptop. It's a it's a communicational device. And also we've been, I mentioned that before, we've been creating a lot of posters related to all kinds of things. So a lot of statements, a lot of like little mantras if you like, but also as you can hear, see here, um, the um, government design principles uh, that um, yeah have been very very popular. Um, so now the team has been first understanding the problem, then have been able to find a really good solution, and now the beta phase is all about building the real service. So everything that has been built in Alpha, um, all the lightweight prototypes that is all code and all stuff to be thrown away. So only in the beta phase, the team is actually developing the real, the real thing. So that means um, proper databases, um, proper hosting, um, proper security, all of that only happens in beta. And beta is something that might happen um, or might be a phase for a few weeks, but quite likely it's a, it's a few months, and in some instances, even, even longer than that. So this is where um, another one of those um, uh, important building blocks comes into place, which is the technology code of practice. So here we describe what kind of technology um, has to be used, how to make it, how to make it resilient, how to make it secure, um, how to build right APIs, how to use APIs, um, what kind of um, yeah data storage is the right one, data ethics as well, touching on that. So all of that a team can read up on the technology code of practice that again sits on Gov UK. And um, I talked about um, avoiding duplica duplication um, quite a bit already. One of the key things for that is government as a platform components. So one of the key things that GDS um, is developing are basically little service components, little products on their own that you can easily plug into your service because we have seen um, while we have been helping the early phases of digital transformation, that a lot of government services are doing the same thing. So again, you do not want to duplicate um, a thing like payments, taking payments, or um, sending out notifications, sending out letters, or um, identifying the user's identity. All of that is stuff that does not to be replicated. Nobody has to build yet another identity component. There's no need for that. So we have been creating components like GovK Notify, that's a component that is sending out letters, emails, and uh, text messages. We've been sending out, I think, more than 2 billion text messages now. It's, it's, it's massive. Um, GovUK Verify is a thing to verify um, users' identity. And pay is about payments, card payments, um, direct debit payments, but also uh, even integrating with um, Google Pay and Apple Pay. So whatever, whatever works for users, we make sure it works in government services. And yeah, government as a platform is the, the thing to do that. Um, I've been talking about the design system, and the design system um, has, on the one hand, for the alpha phase, um, the GovUK prototyping kit. But then, if you go into beta phase, you want to have proper front end code. And again, um, there's another subcomponent in the design system that is the front end toolkit. And this is basically where you just not try to recreate the style of GovUK, but you actually have 
the entire library is there. You can just copy over the code, all the CSS styling, everything is in there. So you, you don't have to try to recreate uh, the appearance of a button. Everything is out of the box into your service, well tested. And most importantly, it is everything. Everything in there is highly accessible. So all of that has been thoroughly tested with screen readers, with magnification, and so on and so on. So all of that comes out of the box with the um, front end toolkit. And you might do a lot of things throughout the beta phase, but um, we, again, have to make sure that you're doing exactly the right thing. So we have um, beta assessments. So Jan's card here says public beta assessment. We also have an earlier um, private beta assessment because the service um, quite likely you're, you're going to you're going to launch and then grow grow the user base, grow the feature set, grow the scope of the service. So we have um, two phases or two smaller phases in that wider um, beta bracket. So first you launch the service just to a smaller uh, user group. You test, um, see how the service is able to scale. Um, what kind of um, user needs you're not fully addressing yet, maybe. And then later, you launch um, the service entirely to the public. And if you use some of the GovUK services, you can see that there's sometimes a little beta flag um, at the very top. So that shows you um, that certain certain services are not um, have not fully um, replaced all the services. And one of the things, again, mentioned earlier, is the GovUK domain. So once your service uh, is going to be uh, public facing, you basically apply, and this comes with your assessment um, and successful assessment, um, where you get um, a, a GovUK service domain. Because this is really what you, what you want, want to have. Because, well, you want to have a very trusted um, GovUK um, domain um, that makes everyone makes it very clear for everyone that this is a genuine service. So the domain ownership also sits with us, which is a power um, and, of course, an uh, important responsibility. And um, there are quite a few few other um, important um, things worth mentioning at this point um, that, that play quite a bit of a role. Um, we do have a creative team. Um, so we have a central creative team that helps us um, communicate all the things that we're doing, communicating these things um, on the one hand to the public, um, but also to um, the, the, the wider peer um, group uh, inside government. So we have a creative team that is able to create, for example, the GDS podcast, um, is able to create little videos. Um, is also creating, um, for example, cards related, to, like Twitter cards, related to very, um, very, um, very recent topics like coronavirus and stuff. So we have a dedicated creative team. We have designers. We have writers. We have um, storytellers um, who are also um, providing providing um, the speeches for ministers, for example. And they're able to really clearly communicate with all our standards um, how um, we are doing what we are doing in a very, very clear way. In addition to that, we have um, quite a few different event formats. We have our sprint conferences. This is a very big um, 800 people conference that we run once uh, a year. Um, that is open to industry. That is open to the wider public sector. Um, and this is where we show well, what kind of progress have we made when it comes to digital transformation in the last year. So there, we always um, invite leaders from other government departments that might actually be talking about yeah, a beta service developed by, by some team, um, as we just discussed in that example. So um, this is the place where you network again, where you met, meet other people who have um, been yeah, going through similar challenges. And then in between um, these sprint conferences, we have a lot of community-related events. So um, we have a uh, bi-monthly um, design meetup, for example. We have meetups around accessibility, around content design, user research, design, you name it, all of that. Um, is stuff that's regularly happening where you can go, where you can show your work, discuss your work, and learn from peers on a regular basis. So it's all about um, that community and interconnectedness, if you want. And then the last thing is, well, um, going live. So this is basically where you might retire an existing service, a legacy service that has been existing. Um, and one of the things um, in there is, um, publishing all kind of data on the performance platform. So um, again, this is a thing I mentioned earlier related to the service standard. In the service standard, we um, ask teams, we demand teams to publish all their performance data. Um, that includes user satisfaction, includes how many users are there, um, trans transaction 
um, numbers, um, cost per transaction, um, completion rate, how many users have been starting the service and um, successfully completed the service the transaction, and also what's the digital take up? Because if we talk about digital um, service transformation, we want to make sure what's the breakdown of the different channels. How many people are using still the old letter service? How many people um, use the phone service? And how many people um, have with a high uh, user satisfaction rate, hopefully, have been adopting the new digital service? So all of that data is public. Uh, you can you can find um, this on the internet, um, and more than um, 700 servers are regularly um, reporting that data. Wow, Martin, um, that was right. Right, <laughs> you pushed me a bit through. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I, I, I know, I know, um, because we we never had uh, we we haven't um, practiced it uh, right before, but. Um, I mean, first of all, thank you for that. Before we go into the questions, um, there are just some things that I want to say um, here. This whole um, support system um, for service innovation at GDS, of course, it developed over the years. It's not something that you plan on the green field. Um, it emerges over time, and all the vehicles that are created um, are a, a, a subject of iteration themselves, of course. Um, so what you see here is a snapshot in time as per today um, with a certain level of granularity that we've chosen. Of course, there's more detail to it. Mm -hmm. um, what I really like about what you've shown is that you have to make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. Um, mm -hmm. Because this is the tendency that I have or that I observe. No, that I don't have mm -hmm. that. Um, that I observe um, with people in the design community oftentimes, because designers like simplicity, but sometimes they exaggerate a little bit. And actually also with quick fix managers um, who say, ah, oh, this is way too complicated. Why can't we just have the three steps? And then they often fall victim to the typical, um, the three or 10 steps to success business books that you find uh, in the yellow press. So that's one thing that's important for me to say. And also I think, it's so interesting to see that a transforming a command control culture will not work with carrots alone. You will yeah. need sticks from time to time um, because old powers are persistent and will push back. But we are persistent too, and we will also push back. And of course, this is a way of power getting re redistributed. If I see that you have all these assessments and that you have to comply to all these different standards that you have, be it the service standards or the general design principles and so on and so forth, they are all centered on one um, uh, group, uh, of, on one stakeholder group, and this is uh, the, the citizens um, of the country. Yeah. Um, and maybe also the, the people who run the service, but maybe not on other stakeholders who might also be affected um, and who would wish that the old way would still be um, like it was. Um, so, so that was really interesting for me to see that the carrots and sticks built in, so to speak. Um, and I switch back to this uh, layout where we can see each other because I would like to open the uh, Q&A. Uh, right now, um, probably we've lost some people already because we, of course, are over time. Um, <laughs> right. But for the remaining people, if there is something um, that you want to ask Martin, um, you can shoot now um, and we will answer it. We are happy to answer it. We'll try to answer it. And uh, this is the time when I will come on stage. So this is Chris from the background and the second Jan on the picture on the left. <laughs> so um, thank you again also for your input from my side. I will use the benefit of being the moderator to raise the first question myself. Please do, until the others come in. Yes. I think there's already one, but yes, go ahead. <laughs> what uh, routine or process do you have in place to um, revise or innovate your very own GDS design process that you just presented? It's a very good question, and it's a very important question. So of course, we take our own medicine, because this is what you have to do. So regularly, we are running discoveries around all kinds of things. Um, and I briefly highlighted um, that 
it can be that, of course, you, you don't get successfully through an assessment. So we have been creating uh, new things that um, had really good discoveries and then alphas. And then at the al end of an alpha, we have might, might decided to not go forward with a certain thing. So we apply all of that stuff to all, all of our organization. We do conduct user research. We have dedicated discovery teams. Um, so recently, a team has been running um, a discovery around um, joining up things and how to make sure that government um, or the users don't have to repeat themselves. Um, so again, like a small team, um, about like four or five people doing a thing for a quarter, very time boxed um, and trying to understand and understand a certain problem. Um, so this is exactly what we are what we're doing um, to ourselves as well. Thanks. So um, we have one or two questions um, concerning the training fee or the cost that will arise for the civil servants or others taking part in the training. Yeah. Um, so there we have, um, I don't have only one answer, but two answers. So, so some of the training um, that we in our, in our team in the user center design space offer, all of that um, training is, is free of charge. Um, but um, some of the more um, more nuanced training that also is offered by the GDS Academy, and there we do have a, a cost recovery model. Um, and yeah, so that there are always pros and cons. Do you charge another part of government because this also comes out of a tax taxpayer's um, purse? Um, but some, for some, in summary, um, cost recovery or um, quite a few training is entirely free of charge. Then maybe one of the more personal questions. So wh why did you go to the UK instead of working on the same services in Germany? Ah. <laughs> um, so such an entity as GDS simply doesn't exist in Germany. Um, of course, with a federated system, um, power and control is handled in a very different way. Um, I think there are, there are great things happening in Germany. Um, the last few years, there's now the um, online access law, um, OZG, Online Zugangsgesetz, um, which is very promising. And there are a lot of services now being digitized or digitalized um, in, a, in, a, in a good way. So there's, there's a lot of stuff happening. Um, I've, been, I've been helping out wherever I can. Um, I've been recently, uh, what do you call it, a, a juror. Um, for Tech for Germany that's doing amazing work. So I'm in close touch and you never know, maybe at some point um, there is something that is interesting uh, or so interesting that I would even leave GDS, but not now. Um, we have a couple of questions aiming in uh, a similar direction, all around, uh, revolving around the question of uh, what were the main challenges that, faced, that you faced, that your team faced when building this massive framework? We have a top three or five list. Hmm. Well, as Jan said, like all of that stuff, um, I think no one was sitting down with a with a map like Jan's and say like this is the stuff um, we have to put in place. So all of that system also was was built based on small steps we have been taking, right? So for example, I talked about um, government government as, as a platform, like building one central payment component or a notifying component. And that stuff all grew out of working at a very early stage, working with a few departments on a few services, 25 services that we have been transforming in the first 400, for 400 days. Um, so we have been doing things and then realize, oh, actually, there's, there's probably a need to do that. And, um, and the same thing with, for example, the, the GovUK design system. Um, we have been just in a, in a very small sandbox creating, creating little, little components. And at some point, the components were, were so good and, and so complex. They're like, OK, they need another wrapper. So all of that stuff you build really step by step by step. Um, it's not something you can envision as a whole and then, then develop. I think, again, that would not be. Um, a good agile governance that would not be an agile approach. You you have to build um, with the the learning that um, and the and the insights that you're gaining. However, I I might ask you a question here now, Martin. What does it need from leadership in order to let such a system emerge? Um, yeah, full stop. Trust. Um, trust. I think is a very very important thing. Um, and I think um, a, a very clear, a very clear vision. And right from the start, um, GDS was always rather on the side of the user than on the side of existing government structures. And um, I think making making this users first um, a very important mantra 
that is, uh, yeah, that is something that people live and breathe day to day is absolutely important. And um, I think having this as the as the most important argument, and of course, always backed with evidence that a certain thing um, has to serve the user eventually is, is really important. But to really answer your question, so uh, in the very in the very um, beginning of GDS, there was a very very strong um, cabinet um, office minister, um, Francis Mort. Um, he was um, a senior minister um, who basically had nothing to lose in a way. Um, he was close to retirement and he really um, enabled and used all his political capital to make sure um, that this stuff um, actually uh, gets off the ground. He was um, commissioning a report um, that I think you had at the very end of your, of your map that was written by Martha Lane Fox. Um, who is also on the board of Twitter um, today and is a digital um, champion for um, um, for the UK, UK government. So you had um, quite a few people um, at the very early stage who had a very thorough understanding of how digital works and advised government to, to take these steps. And then um, you had a senior minister who said, like, yes, do it that way. Um, focus on the users. Um, be, in a way, radical. Um, so that report actually had the headline um, revolution, not evolution. So taking bold steps um, and yeah, senior leadership buy-in that is persistent and is unblocking a lot of things is fundamental to get something like this off the ground. Um, that's weird that it wasn't McKinsey or Boston Consulting that that advised government in all of that, but it, that it was Martha Lane Fox, uh, Francis Mode, and then these people that's what I heard about uh, from BBC and The Guardian. Former BBC and Guardian uh, were the first people yeah. who picked all that off. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, 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 exactly. These were the people on the on the ground. Uh, Mike Brecken and Tom, um, Tom Loosmore, exactly. Uh, okay. Quite a few people um, that came in from, from the outside. But they have been, they have been um, trying to uh, give government a push for, for a few time before that. So these are all people who are very interested and eager um, to help government innovate, and um, yeah, um, it needs okay. the right right people in the in the in the right space. But there are quite so a listen lot of up, other... German government. Once one sec, Martin. That's important for me. Listen up, German government. You don't need McKinsey, BCTV, and all the others to create your government services. You could also do it in a different way. And the digital marketplace. Oh my goodness, what a great thing is that. My statement is done. He's, he's a little stakeholder. <laughs> yeah, let's go back to the questions. The question is, um, how do you cope or manage with the resistance of uh, the civil servants that don't like to become, uh, to, to let the services become digital? Um, so one of, the, one of the things, so the situation when it comes to um, finance looks quite different um, in, in various countries um, and there has been a lot of um, authority if you like uh, a lot of cost savings needed um, in in UK government so the so the budget in the last 10 years um, at least until last year was constantly being reduced so if you suddenly have um, less money available to provide service to, to citizens what is it that you do um, if you are fully aware that providing a digital service is much, much cheaper. So we have a lot of breakdown um, of what um, service provision per channel costs and digital is massively cheaper. So I think one argument for that is, is, simply, is simply cost saving. And there is a lot of pressure on government um, to use as well um, existing budgets um, that might be stable uh, in a more wise way. Um, so one of the one of the key drivers is basically cost saving and also meeting at the same time, of course, meeting citizens' expectations. Um, and it can be very frustrating if you um, always have to wait um, to um, get into a phone call. Um, so serving citizens better and also um, saving money for your department is quite a strong argument. Mm -hmm. And besides being a cost saving center, do you have any idea about the cost center of the GDS? So what um, amount of investment in terms of time, stuffing, uh, was flat into the system to build this system? So a lot of, um, so GDS budget um, from, the, from the very early years um, has been, has been um, increasing. So um, there were various business cases you can you can all find that stuff on the internet 
Um, there was one bigger business case in 20, 2015 um, that was specifically um, linked to uh, all the potential cost savings. So we have making we have uh, been making investments like in government as a platform with all those um, payment um, and notification um, components because we we were able to um, build a business case for um, Treasury um, to say look. If all these services don't replicate and build the same component again and again and again, but we do this centrally, well, we can save uh, amount X, Y. So um, we have been making um, successful business cases um, to, well, yeah, um, as well, um, save costs there. Right now, GDS, um, we are about um, 850 people. Um, so yeah, we're not that small. Um, that, of course, um, costs some money to run, clearly. Um, but if you look at the larger benefits um, for um, digital transformation in, in, in government, um, that uh, is clearly uh, making sense. And there was a business case um, just alone for the GovUK design system that was just um, finished. Um, and as well, my colleague um, Tim Paul talked about that. So the benefits of running the GovUK design system, which is, I think, now um, run by a team of uh, six to eight people, um, the benefit is 20, no, sorry, um, 17 million pounds per year. So a team of eight um, generating um, benefits of 17 million pounds because service teams don't have to reinvent the wheel. So we are making, even for, for smaller components, or always business case that what is the return on invest? Um, it is not just um, yeah, doing good, of course. Uh, it is about looking at the benefits that we are creating for the wider public. What is the, the public value creation uh, mechanism there. Okay. Um, I have a bullshit in, bullshit out question for you. So I can imagine um, how you do this journey with civil servants who suggest genuinely new services, so you can start discovery from scratch. Um, but how do you handle classic digitization cases of analog services? that are in place for years becoming digital. So for example, registering a license plate for your car. I mean, um, all of that stuff, I mean, you would you would take the, the same approach, right? Like all of all of the, if that's the question, uh, correct me if I'm if I'm getting the, the the question wrong, but like all of the stuff discussed, like is 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 equally relevant for um, creating creating uh, a service related to an existing paper-based service. Um, and one of the key things I mentioned, I think, um, well enough, is that we have to serve um, people with whatever their capability is, right? So we have been, we have um, a digital um, inclusion, um, we have digital inclusion strategies, and we have a very good overview of how many people are actually able to use digital, digital channel. And one of the key things is we have to be able to provide really an inclusive service offering. So it will never happen that 100% of the UK citizens are going to use the digital service. We just have to simply acknowledge that. But we have to make sure that our digital services are the basically the preferred channels. The online channel is the preferred channel. But we have to, at the same time, make sure that everyone else is included and can use the service in the channel that really works for them. So this is a fundamental fundamental thing to do. So very likely, um, if there's still an old version uh, of registering a, a number plate, that service is not going to go away. But at the same time, we have been we have been bringing all the learnings from the digital channels um, and bringing this into into the paper version. So we've been iterating even previously. To be honest, like pretty shitty forms with weird questions written in in government legalese and transformed that. When the digital service was transformed, we simplified the questions and playing them back, played back these sim simplified questions also to the paper form. So we always take a very holistic end-to-end cross-channel service view. Um, and all of these um, things are interconnected and we see them in an interconnected way. Thanks. Um, there's one concerning other supporting stakeholders. So you already mentioned that there were some individuals like thought leaders but are there any other stakeholders from outside the GDS community which help you drive forward? Um, well, so you always have you always have um, a lot of stakeholders in government. Um, so government is still quite hierarchical, while GDS might might not be. 
Um, so one of the one of the formats we have is, for example, um, digital um, and um, technology uh, leaders network. Um, so that this network comes together every month um, in a in a physical or virtual session. Um, so these are all the people who are leading digital and um, technology um, as a as a thing in their um, respective organization. So there's kind of like like forty people or so. They are regularly um, in touch. They talk to each other. They also um, inform GDS what kind of things they are they are missing, what they're needing, um, because of course now we have been building up quite a bit of um, quite a bit of uh, capability. So just the Ministry of Justice, for example, they have probably like 150 um, very capable digital people now that they are that, that are building um, their services. Um, so so they're very very much ahead. Um, then of course you have. Uh, with change of government, uh, new ministers, you always have have, have, have these people um, who might have a slightly different agenda. Um, but at the same time, it is it is always um, as well an opportunity to really um, in, in, in inform them about certain things that are that are high high priority. So it's um, the civil service uh, doesn't change, while of course the government layer does change. Um, and of course, these are important stakeholders you have, you have to bring in and, of course, explain uh, what you have been doing the last, let's say, 10 years and why this is important and why it needs um, constant investment as well and um, a strong leadership, why you need them to advocate for your cause. So that is, of course, a very important um, group. Um, and then, yeah, you might also um, have, um, of course, you, you collaborate I mean, in the context of coronavirus, for example, there has been a very um, tight uh, relationship with um, WhatsApp and um, other Facebook products. Um, in one instance, we needed um, a WhatsApp bot, for example, and together with the Facebook teams, um, we have been creating um, that, I think, over, over just two days. So in various instances, you need as well um, other, other partners to help. Uh, another another example for that is we've been working closely with Google to present um, service information as the first result uh, in a very, very um, prominent way. So we have been creating for our services so-called step-by-step navigation guides um, where we explain you how to actually um, uh, get a driving license, for example. And, and these kind of things are presented in very nice uh, uh, and very clear, crisp cards um, as a top Google result. So that kind of stuff you have to engage with various stakeholders, whether, whether it's political, technolo technological. So that's kind of like an ongoing um, stakeholder management exercise you have to do basically. Hey, Chris, can, can, I, can I take the word for just a sec? Um, I want to try an experiment because we are way over time anyways. And there are some, some participants who are still with us. Thank you for that. Um, let's try because we're not that many participants anymore. Um, to individually uh, unmute people and talk directly. I would like to uh, unmute Isabel right now um, mm -hmm. and would like to test it, if that works. If not, we stick to the, to the old plan that you moderate, Chris, but let's try it. So Isabel can ask her question herself. Okay, Isabel, I just sent you a request that you share your microphone so you can ask Martin your question yourself. Let's see if that works. Isabel is typing. Maybe she's gone already. And I can hear a sound. No mic. Sorry. OK, Isabel has no mic. Then I asked the question from Isabel, because um, it would be unfair if I, <laughs> because of that, it should, the question would have no chance. She asked a really interesting question, Martin. She asked, how often are you able to really start with a problem? And then she said, we are usually confronted with solutions and need a lot of time to prove to the decision makers to go back to the problem. Yeah. That of course uh, is a is a thing um, that we are familiar with, but at the same time, the discovery phase is is created for exactly the avoidance of that. So the discovery phase is a format, or is a, is a, is a dedicated period of time where you are supposed to really understand the problem first and not develop anything. And um, we have um, created all these um, assurance check-ins. Um, and assessments where really we make sure that a team is not building anything in that stage. And we will we will very um, thoroughly as an kind of individual um, entity, if you like, we, we will uh, question why you have been um, then going into a certain solution, why you're taking that path at a very early stage. 
So we will, we will scrutinize that if that's the case. Um, maybe there might be good good reasons um, for really narrowing down on one solution um, early, but um, a team would have to clearly state and argue and evidence that. I see, I see. Um, Chris, I don't know, can you share microphones as well uh, with your role? Otherwise, I'm, I'm doing this now. Um, I want to try again if she's still there with Katriana uh, and Pablo, um, if, if she's in, still in there. Um, but it looks like she's not in there anymore, but Pablo is. Um, I can switch him on because he had some, some question about physical uh, service and digital service in connection. Let's see if that works. Pablo, do you hear us? Uh, yes, do you hear me? Yes, loud and clearly. Hi, um, thanks a lot for your really cool presentation, Martin and uh, Jan. Uh, was uh, really cool insights. Um, I was um, I read one question and I also repeated it because I think it was really good. In what way do you connect to the physical services and how do you connect GDS to um, people that work in offices where citizens go to? Um, how do you yeah try to merge with physical the physical part of the services? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good question. So I think our even our understanding of what digital means has been has been shifting a bit over the over the years. So digital doesn't mean for us like the online channel. Digital is something that underpins everything we do. So even even the physical space is very likely to be underpinned by digital, right? Um, and that um, includes making sure that uh, civil servants um, who are working in a contact center, who are working um, in a in a walk in. Um, facility um, that they are equipped with the right tools. So uh, quite a lot of government departments um, have been working on case management, um, case management, case management uh, systems and tools. There's a lot of work for internal internal services, and um, in various instances, service designers have been as well creating better layouts of of um, um, spaces. Um, so citizen offices where where citizens are. Um, walking in face to face and trying to prototype that, reconfigure that. Um, so all of that is is is, is clearly touching this. Um, a service designer um, at GDS, she's been working on um, better better scripts um, for contact centers. Um, and um, the one service designer, for example, in the Department of Work and Pension, um, he's been redesigning as well all the letters and then the way we 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 communicate. So there's a lot of physical touch points. And we understand digital as a thing that underpins everything. So these things are, are interconnected. And more and more, um, the digital teams have been working closer and closer with operations teams who are running things on a day-to-day -day basis, um, often related to the physical space. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I think, Martin, there's uh, an old acquaintance of yours here in the audience. And I really loved his question. Um, and it's Reto. If it's the Reto, we will see. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to give him the chance to answer the question himself if he can switch on the microphone. If not, I will ask the question here. Let's see. There he is. Can you hear me? Loud and clearly. OK. Well, thanks a lot for your work and also for your presentation and the discussion today, Jan and Martin. Um, I'm very impressed. Uh, one of the questions I'm wondering, I mean, you, you showcased a very linear, very standardized, very nice service uh, approach, innovation approach. Uh, you have all these checkpoints, you have all these libraries. Do you, are you not afraid of creating a very big monoculture within governmental services, which might lead to kind of missing novel approaches, whether it's in the process or in the final solution? Are you not afraid that you don't have enough competition among services, amongst uh, different entities, not enough space for experimentation due to your, your very rigid top-down control mechanism you establish? I think somehow it seems like I have, thank you for your question, first of all, and great, great to hear you. Um, I think maybe I have, I have uh, done a, maybe a bad job of describing this as a, as a too rigid um, framework because we are just, telling people the, the, the rough outlines, the, 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 the broader strokes, but what they do in the discovery, what they do in the alpha, what kind of technologies they think and explore is the best solution to the problem that, that they have un identified. We are not um, prescribing or describing in any way. 
So we are always, if, if they say, well, there shouldn't be um, a digital, a digital um, service front end at all, there should be an only an API, I mean, cool. If they are using machine learning for stuff, great. If they have evidence, they can do literally whatever they want if they are following the, the, the underlying principles that we set out, everything is fine. Um, and teams have been have been taking very radical approaches. So I think we have, have not seen any of that where, where, where teams are going, going too narrow. Um, and of course, we say in a beta phase, for example, please use our uh, pay, pay component. Um, but if teams have a, have a very good argument why the, um, the payment component is not suitable, well, we, we will take this on board um, let them to go ahead with another thing, but at the same time, try to learn from that and will very likely um, iterate our payment component based on that. So I think this, this level of monoculture, I think monoculture uh, relates as well to, to, to people, people's ways of thinking. Um, and I think our discussions are continuously evolving. Our communities of practice are really diverse and government as a whole is doing a lot when it comes to um, becoming the most diverse um, employer. So that uh, heavily relates um, to culture. Um, so we, we just, just in the design team, we've been uh, publishing, for example, earlier this year, two blog posts about how we have been um, assessing the diversity of the design team, making, making sure and making clear commitments as well, how we want to diversify in the next few years, how, how do we make sure that we have uh, more uh, minority um, ethnic um, um, members in our design team. Um, so I think when it comes to um, ways of thinking and representation, um, we're doing a lot to make sure that there is no more monoculture at all. And as I said, we are constantly um, in exchange with the outside world. We, we try to learn as, as much as possible, bring in new voices. We've been working with a lot of um, NGOs, NPOs. Uh, we've been working um, with a lot of um, other think tanks um, who, who are um, challenging us. Um, people, of course, send um, freedom of information um, requests as well. Um, and I think it's important that government uh, is constantly scrutinized and actions are questioned um, because this this um, makes us better as well. So I think we have we have a um, we have a um, clear there's clear requirement for us to be as transparent um, as possible. So um, other entities can also um, and of course Parliament plays a big role as well. Uh, make sure that that we are um, as as open um, and as diverse as possible in in, in any way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I also want to thank you, Reto, for this question because it shows that we have to iterate um, this visualization. Um, because in the end, if I just bring it up again, um, there are carrots and sticks in here, um, and most of it is carrots. Um, there are only a few sticks. It's usually these assessments um, you have to go through and some of the criteria you have to match, um, which are very human-centric. So maybe in the next iteration, we should definitely highlight that because um, this is not supposed to be another uh, stage gate, agile fall, whatever model uh, that we like in Germany. Um, this just shows, okay, this is the support system. These are the offerings you can use if you are stuck in a certain phase um, because all of this enables you to proceed. Whereas what we see in most organizations, not only in government, also in big other organizations, is teams are supposed to innovate, but then, of course, they have to um, uh, start their gauntlet running with all the barriers they run into all the time. Um, and they don't know how to start, where to start, and they have no support at all. Um, so this, this is something we should probably highlight next time, that probably it's only four, four sticks in there and the rest is carrots. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank um, you. Then let's see. Um, I would say last question, and then we, we, we finish this totally overstretched session that we had here, like in a real bar camp. Um, I like this one. Um, is Doctor still in the session? Let's see. Yes, from Munich, Germany. Um, let's see if she can ask her question herself. I hope it's a she, the photo looks like. Maybe she can join us with the microphone. If not, I ask her question. Oh, hey. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, Martin. Nice to meet you again. Um, 
Uh, my question is because I've been, you know, talking to some of some people in the Munich government mm -hmm. uh, in the last year, um, and they told me that they only work with really like the huge consultancy. So you know, I think they're only like um, I would say, you know, like the, the really big four consultancies in there. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? I mean, you've been, you know, I'm sure you've been talking to them for a couple of years already. How well are you prepared to really get things on the ground because everything is so like fragmented? Can, can, you, can you rephrase your question just to be sure I'm, I'm really getting it right? Um, okay, I think it's actually there are two questions. So how well the first one is like, because they're so fragmented, how well do you think are they prepared in German government to really um, implement digital services? Oh, now it's about German government. Okay, okay, okay. German government. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I think there are some some very promising things happening. So first of all, with when it comes to the so this is just my personal opinion, right? So I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not representing the UK government <laughs> or the German government at all, zero. Um, so I think there's some there's some really remarkable things happening. For example, um, on a federal level, um, so Baden-Württemberg they have the service service um, BW um, platform where they are as well working with municipalities on distinct services. And then once one service um, is developed with um, one municipality, other municipalities can basically onboard to the same service and they just get their distinct branding. And I think again, having, having um, a joint um, platform approach, I think is really, really good to see. Um, there are people um, in uh, Stuttgart uh, and around um, as well close to uh, Lake Constance um, who are heavily um, investing into um, user centricity, doing really remarkable work. And um, in Germany, um, Jan mentioned the public service lab. We've been working on a thing called um, the um, Preis um, für gute Verwaltung. So it's um, Verwaltungspreis. De. Um, so this is a this is a thing we have been honoring um, really exemplary work. Um, in the wider public um, service uh, and service sector uh, in Germany. So I think there are really remarkable things doing, um, happening. Um, also, central government um, has been um, publishing some really good guidance um, around um, agile governance, around um, user centricity. So I think there are more and more things happening. And of course, at, um, Tech for Germany as well, um, really bringing in capable young people who are working then um, with also open-minded civil servants in various um, government departments on um, kind of 10, I think 10 week challenges. So I think there are many small initiatives, but there is less of a, less of a one body that is able to, to really um, change things. And I think, I mean, Germany has its, has its um, history and therefore um, it's um, federal uh, approach and a different um, understanding of distributing power. So all of that is, is of course, of course um, related to, to history and that's very understandable. So I think um, every country, and this is, um, so I'm very engaged as well um, with international um, um, design community um, in the public sector. Um, and we see different approaches in, in every country. And that, and that is very, very natural because we have different contexts, different circumstances that, that make certain things uh, work and not work. So that di diplomatic answer, right? But yeah, I think, I think there, is, <laughs> yes. there, is, there is really, there's really good, um, good stuff happening in various um, pockets. And more and more you see people in German government um, connecting with each other, um, sharing best practices, so all of that stuff, that this learning um, as, a, as a community of practice is more and more happening, which is amazing to see. Is, is there maybe another country that does it also that fragmented, like, or? Yeah, have you seen best practices from like because i think if it's centralized you know it, it looks you know that the speed is much faster but if it's not centralized i think it's yeah. very confusing maybe also i think in canada and as well um, australia you have a lot of you know a lot of little little pockets uh, uh nova scotia for example like in uh, or um, new south wales in australia they're, they're doing a lot of things and like um, other other territories in australia are, are then learning learning from 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 their action so i think you, you see similar similar things in other countries as well that have a federated system, yeah, and same as well in the in the US, um, where maybe on a, on a city level um, a lot of stuff is happening, um, and maybe in parallel um, on a federal level. So yeah. 
Well, cool. well, well, this is our last you. question. We are half, that was half an hour over time. Of course, as always. Um, but it was really a pleasure. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Martin. Yeah. Such an insightful session. I'm, I'm also so happy that we finally kind of worked this out, um, discussed it in the public. Uh, let's see if we can maintain it also in the future. And maybe you can use it also for your work. Um, I hope you can. Uh, thank you for ev everyone for your great questions um, and the lively discussions we had in the end. Also good that we could test it our tool with uh, live microphone and so on because we are still uh, struggling to um, get uh, uh, master all our tools here. Um, but one thing I have mastered in this tool, and this is what I want to leave you with. Um, I'm sending you now the link here it comes. I'm sending you now the link to both our Fleep channel and to the GDS blog. So you can enter the Fleep, ask us any questions that we still could not answer. Maybe we can send you some blog articles or other things uh, there. So, and I send it again because it was too short. So uh, there it is again. Um, just click the blue button, there you come to the fleet channel. And after the session now, we will have a look at it from time to time. So whenever there's still something popping up, um, we try to answer that. Thank you very much. I, I also had one link to share. Um, this, yes, is our, our, cool. our YouTube, uh, this is our YouTube channel for user-centered design. If anyone wants to watch one of our um, talks there, these are not just talks from GDS, but from the wider UK government, interesting um, stories on there. So you can also subscribe, um, regularly post new um, talks and new videos there. So that's also like a good, a good resource. Great. I will share that right away in Fleep as well. Very good. So then bye-bye, everyone. It was sure. a pleasure having you. And Likewise. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.